It didn't say, if you had faith and do not doubt, nothing would be impossible for God. No. Nothing would be impossible for you. Because you're a son of God. Look, people say that all the time. Well, Jesus was the son of God. And you're not? Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. And you're not? Jesus was the true man. He was what we're supposed to look like. Do not build your doctrine and stuff off of what other men's experiences are. You should probably just build your doctrine off what Jesus' experiences were and off of what Jesus taught. The reason that we're afraid of hurting, uh, that we don't want to talk about this is because we're afraid of hurting people's feelings. Okay? So, you're going to have to make up your mind. Do you, um, do you worship people's feelings or do you worship God? We don't want to hurt people's feelings. You know what we're too worried about? We're too wor we are too worried about what people are going to think about us when we talk to them about the truth. And we're not fearing God. One day I'm going to stand before God on Judgment Day. And you know what? He's going to tell me, well done, good, faithful servant. Thank you for telling them the truth, even though they didn't want to receive it. The truth will set you free. We're more afraid of hurting people's feelings than we are afraid of misrepresenting the gospel. But it would actually set them free if we were bold enough to preach it. It would set them free. It would set somebody free. Somebody would get it eventually. If we kept on preaching it. So the word of God's going to change their life. We would be convinced that the unseen... We would be convinced of the unseen, and we would do exactly what the rest of the passage says. It says, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, 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 it will move. It doesn't say it might move. If you have faith, the, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here, and it, it might move. Maybe. Hopefully. We are wishing it will move. Not what this says. It does not say, hey, you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, and you know, sometimes it'll move. You know what this teaches me? If you spoke to the mountain and it didn't move, then you did not have a mustard seed faith. Which can be very helpful or very discouraging. Because you know what we usually use this passage for when people are discouraging their faith. I just don't know if I have... Look, look, dear. You only need faith of a mustard seed. You know, Jesus didn't do that. That's not when Jesus said this. Jesus didn't do that when somebody was struggling with their faith. When they were being discouraged about their faith. Jesus said this to the people who thought they had faith. You hear me? Je Look, Jesus didn't tell this story, this parable, or this illustration of a mustard seed faith to people. He did not tell it to people who admitted that they had little faith. He told it to people who thought they had enough faith. Why could we not cast it out? You don't know the answer. Haven't I been walking with you long enough? Don't you know the answer? I've told you already. It has to do with faith. It's because of your little faith. What? Oh, but, but we have faith. I'll tell you if you had faith in Christ. I like a mustard seed. This is not a, a feel-good passage. We use it all the time for a feel-good passage. It's not designed to be a feel-good passage. It's designed to be a slap-you-up-the-face passage. But we use it all the time to console people. Well, if you just, you just need a faith of a mustard seed. Well, define the faith of a mustard seed. What is mustard seed faith? Here's the telltale sign that it's a mustard seed faith. The mountain moved. Did the mountain move? If the mountain did not move, then you do not have mustard seed faith. 
How do I know that? Because Jesus is not a liar. And he said right here, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here, and it will move. It will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. He didn't say nothing will be impossible for the doctors. He said nothing will be impossible for you. For you. This is a pivotal passage right here. This is one of the most important passages I think has to do with all of us walking in faith. You know what this also teaches me? We don't need to get discouraged when we don't see something happen. First of all, there's good news. It's not God's fault. That should really encourage you. You know what the problem is? Most people think it is God's fault. Well, maybe it's not God's will. Maybe it's not God's timing. They always throw it onto God. Maybe God's trying to teach me a lesson. Maybe it was only because Jesus could do something like this. They run from responsibility. They don't ever say, you know what? They didn't get healed because they didn't have faith. They never say what Jesus taught. They only say what the church is trying to teach. What man's doctrine, rooted in unbelief, has created and pulled over our eyes and kept us sick. Kept us poor. Kept us defeated. All those lies, well, maybe it's not God's will. All those lies, maybe it's not God's timing. All those lies, maybe God's trying to teach you a lesson. It's all lies. It's a cop-out for, for not walking in faith. People say it all the time. And it's crippled us as a church. We have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. The Bible teaches us to stay away from those people. Let's find that scripture real quick. Having a form of godliness. This is 2 Timothy, I think. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Having a form of godliness. Watch this. Look, look, look how much God, look, God despises churches that do this. He puts them in the same category as some pretty awful people. Let's look at this. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, Arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. All those churches out there that have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. He just compared them all to slanderers and people without self-control, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, heartless, reckless, ungrateful, unholy, abusive, arrogant, proud, lovers of money, lovers of self. Uh, avoid such people. Why? Because they're going to kill your faith. Why do we avoid those people? Because they are trying to destroy your faith. They pray and don't get answers. That's why they start, they start leaving the church. God's dead to them. Why? Because we keep telling them, well, maybe it's not God's will. Yeah. People just don't pray anymore because they, when they pray, they don't get results. Right? And it has nothing to do with God. They don't get results because of their own hearts. But we want to put it on God. And of course we don't want to believe in that God because that God doesn't even exist. A God that doesn't answer your prayers? That, that God doesn't... You know what that God is? That's like every other God. <laughs> God that doesn't answer your prayers. He's like every other God. Like Buddha and all these other people. Buddha's not a real God. He's a man, but... The enlightened one, but... Yeah. All these other gods that can't rescue you you know, the Old Testament, God was bold. He said, go pray to your other gods, see if they answer you. God wants to be challenged. Well, Jesus says, don't test the Lord. 
You read your Bible. Gideon tested the Lord three times. <laughs> the word testing there has nothing to do with testing God's faithfulness. It has to do with tempting God's wrath. Don't test the Lord like you did at Mariba when they grumbled and complained and didn't get a word from God, but they acted on a lie. We're not, we're not talking about testing the Lord's faithfulness. You're supposed to test the Lord's faithfulness. That's why in the Old Testament, one of the, the prophets, it says, test me in this. Bring the full tithe into my storehouse and see into my temple and see that I will not pour out Open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain. Test the Lord in this. God wants to be challenged. He wants to prove that he is the real God. And all the other things you trust in are faulty. Why? Because it brings him glory. And also because God loves you. Jesus teaches his disciples, you're not going to have to pray to me. You just pray right to God because he loves you. And he'll answer your prayers. We read that last time. All right, let's keep on going. Where are we at? Um, God's good. All right. We're good stuff here. Matthew, okay, we read Matthew 21, 21. James 1, verse 6. Look at this one. So now we've been talking about faith, right? What is faith? It's the conviction of things unseen. So if we have little conviction, things unseen, you know what that means? We're more convinced of what we do see. That's called unbelief. So I think whenever it's talking about little faith, I don't really think it's talking about the size of your faith alone. I think it's talking about little faith, like little conviction of things unseen, which means that those aren't the, the that, first of all, faith is conviction. Okay. Faith is conviction of things unseen. Well, if there's unseen, then there's definitely seen. So when he says, because of your little conviction of things unseen, what he's really saying is, there's two things here that are being weighed out. The unseen versus the seen. So if if faith can be defined as the things, as conviction in the things unseen, then unbelief is conviction in the things seen. They're both faith. But one has to do with unseen, and one has to do with the seen. So little faith is, what it's saying is, you have little conviction of the things unseen. In other words, you can't, are you even seeing the things that are unseen? Can you see? Can you imagine? Can you see with faith the thing that you cannot see? Are you fully persuaded that the things that are unseen will override the things that are seen? But if you have little conviction of things unseen what that implies is there's the conviction of things that are being seen that are outweighing the convictions of the things that are unseen so when we say little faith it's not saying that you just have little faith and that's it it's really saying that there's a balance here on this scale where you have faith and you have unbelief you have conviction of things unseen versus conviction of the things that you're seeing and when he says you have little faith, what he's saying is you're more convinced of the things that you're seeing than you are of the things that you're not seeing. And that's unbelief. That is what unbelief looks like. If faith is believing, it's not just believing. It's not just believing, it's conviction. What, what is conviction? Conviction makes you do stupid things. Conviction is something that you believe so much in that you can't, you'll never be shaken. It's a tree with giant roots. That's what conviction is. Conviction, it causes a person to do dumb stuff. People, foolish things people think sometimes. Conviction will cause you to go to battle and die. Conviction will cause you to jump onto a, a hand grenade to save everyone else around you. Conviction. Conviction is a death of self. And it's a devotion to a bigger cause. Conviction. Conviction. 
sold out, wholehearted. Nothing can get in my way. That's conviction. When I say I'm going to build the barracks discipleship house because I got a word from God. And everybody was like, you're crazy. People come up to me and say things like, you're irresponsible for quitting your job. You have a family to think about. And all I can think of, no, I've taken responsibility of the calling God's given to me. If I didn't obey, I would be irresponsible and disobedient, and I'd be under judgment from God. That's conviction and fear of the Lord. I don't fear my family going hungry. I fear displeasing the Lord. I have conviction. I know God's told me to do something. I'm going to do it. End of story. I don't care what my family members think. I don't care what my friends think. They're not God. I don't have to answer them. And answer God. When I stand before God on judgment day, he'll say to me, well done, good faithful servant. Or he'll say, why didn't you do what I told you to do? How do I know? Because I know how important it is to obey the Lord. It brings life. Fight. There is a way that seems right to man, and its way is destruction. It always leads to death. But the way of the Lord brings life. So they look at me like I'm an idiot. You quit your job. To, follow, to, to do this thing. They didn't think I was even following God. They just thought I was being a fool. People starting Bible studies up because I quit my job. Titled, Never Quit Your Job to Follow God, God into Ministry. Those people come up to me later after three years. Man, I just want to tell you, you inspire me and you know, when you first quit your job, I didn't think you were going to make it. But now I've seen what God's been doing in your life and how you've been changing all these other guys' lives. And, and, and you know, the financial miracles God's provided for you, it's just blown me away. Yeah, because I had conviction. You have comfortable stuff. Conviction never leads to a comfortable life. Conviction always leads to death. Why well, you can't say that, Zach? You're going to scare people away from following Jesus. Jesus did that too. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Oh, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father. The, the dead, Let the dead bury the dead. But you go preach the gospel. Conviction. Jesus is like, I, Jesus would not be satisfied with some people that go to church nowadays. Jesus didn't call us to be Christians. Jesus called us to be disciples. A disciple lays down his life, sells everything he's got if he has to, to follow Jesus. Armor bearer. Hmm. People say, well, I, you know, I was a Christian before I was a disciple. Impossible. I was a Christian before I become a disciple. Impossible. You cannot be a Christian if you're not a disciple. I, you know, I was, I, I made Jesus my Savior before I made him Lord. Impossible. The book of Romans chapter 10 says, you confess Jesus as Lord and you will be saved. It doesn't say you can confess him as Savior and then maybe later on choose if you're going to follow him as Lord. No, if you don't make him Lord, you're not even saved. He's Lord. What is Lord? Boss. Master owner of your life. You do not own your life. Well, Zach, that sounds so negative. It's life. It's like the man who sold everything he had so he could go buy the field that had the treasure in it. The trade-off is way... It's unfair. Trade-off is unfair. It is not a fair bargain. It is not a fair trade. Me trading my life for the life Jesus gives me, that's not a fair trade. <clears throat> but it will cost you everything. People think grace comes free. Well, it does, but it doesn't. <laughs> the gospel is free of charge. It just costs you everything. Your whole life is going to cost you everything. Everything. We need to stop taking Christianity lightly. Like, hey, you know what? Let's just get people to say a prayer. They all go to heaven. 
It's called false conversions. That's why Matthew chapter 7 says, Not everyone says to me, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. And many will say to me on that day, Do we not cast out demons, prophesy in your name, perform many miracles, and I will tell them, Depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Just because you say Lord doesn't make him your Lord. It's a heart issue. It's not just a sinner's prayer. Is your life changing? No, no change, no Jesus. You can't put Jesus in you and not change. Well, Zach, I mean, we're all going to sin. Look, we all sin. Just because you got saved doesn't mean you're never going to sin again. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about heart change. I'm talking about the fact that you can't live with yourself when you have Jesus and you keep on doing sin. Your heart's doing somersaults and flipping and saying, what am I? You can't stay there if you have Jesus. You can't. You're so restless. You can't even live with yourself. You got to do something. You're always running. And you're like Jonah, you know, trying to run away and then the storms are coming. And you can't even continue on in that path if you really have Jesus in your heart. You can't. I'm not saying you can't go sin and even live in some habitual sin after you get saved. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if Jesus is truly your Lord, you can't stay there. You're, it will bust through. It will bust through. And you'll remember who you belong to. And you'll say, I can't live like this anymore. And you'll fall to your knees and repent. Because you'll know. I know even whenever I tried to deny God. I remember, man, there was one point I was so upset with God because I was before I believed in the supernatural, I was struggling with it so much. I remember telling the Lord, man, if you're good, if you're real, you've got to be the God that answers prayers. And I remember cussing and yelling at God. And I wanted to stop believing. I wanted to so badly. I wanted to just give up on everything and say, screw all this. It's a bunch of hogwash. That's what I wanted to say. But something wouldn't let me go. wouldn't let me go. And I thank you, God, that none can snatch him out of his hands. No one can snatch him out of my father's hands. Something wouldn't let me go. God's good. What are we talking about? Getting way off here. <laughs> oh Jesus is awesome there's nothing you can do that will ever cause God to stop loving you that is so important nothing you know I've talked some hard stuff but I want to say this right now I, I teach some hard things I even teach things that might make people question their salvation and I ain't going to apologize for it either because I want people to really be saved and go to heaven when they die I care about them if I made it easy on you, then people, I think I would, I would keep on asking, hey, I'd make people feel good all the way to hell. Oh, don't worry, man. You, you, you're saved. I mean, and then they go right to hell? No, that's not cool. Why don't I just tell them the truth? Let them work out their salvation with fear and trembling. You need to. You have to. It's important. But we don't want people living in fear. The, Jesus said, the, Paul said that. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Trembling doesn't sound like respect. Trembling sounds like I'm afraid. Fear and trembling. We should be afraid a little bit. It helps keep us in check. You know? <laughs> I really don't believe you can lose your salvation. But I don't tell people to stop teaching that. <laughs> I don't even argue with those people. I'm like, hey, you know what? You go do what you do. I'm going to do what I do. Maybe we'll save some people. I don't think is it. I don't think that's even having a real argument. To be honest with you, people are like, oh, you can't do that. You gotta. Uh, -uh. no. Look, there's too many people living in sin right now that think they're saved. And they're not. They think they're saved, but they're not. The only person who'll know is them and God. They'll know. In my situation, I God wouldn't let me go. I knew it. This. Poor
tool from God. You see what I'm saying? But there's some people that are not remorseful of their sin at all. They just live right in it. I'm saying that those people might not be saved. And it's not your job to make them feel better about it so that they stay unsaved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let them squirm a little bit. <laughs> Wait, I know that's not funny. I'm laughing. I'm laughing because it's the truth. We need to squirm a little bit. And then we need to seek God. The Bible says very clearly it's not too late. I'll read this scripture to you. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. That's Joel chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. Yet even now, yet e what is he saying? They're all about to die. Yet even now, yet even now, that should be the word. When somebody's struggling, don't, don't, don't encourage them in their salvation. Tell them, yet even now, if you repent, there's salvation and hope for you. Don't make them feel good about their sin. That's the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't you dare quench the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Sometimes when people are sinning, it's the Holy Spirit that's getting them, not the devil. <laughs> and if they're coming to you because they're seeking repentance, that's the Holy Spirit driving them to repentance. The, the hand of the Lord was heavy upon me. That's not the devil. That's God. The hand of the Lord. You ever get that lump in your throat? That's the Lord. You ever feel that thing go up your back and your spine because you know you did something wrong and you feel like you're about to get struck by lightning or something? That's the Lord. That's not the devil. The devil is taking God's conviction and making you feel like they're, like it's absolutely hopeless for you and that, and, and that you, there is no hope for you. You can't repent. That's the devil. God is pulling, is when he comes at you, he, you see what I'm saying? He's coming at you and he's going to be hard on you because he loves those he disciplines. When you feel that, you're being disciplined by the Holy Spirit. You got to listen to it. Don't resist it. And say, God, but know this, what the scriptures where it says right now, yet even now, return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious. You can always return. I believe that with all my heart. God never stops loving you. Never stops loving you. God can't stop loving you. He loved you while you were his enemy. What makes you think he'll stop loving you now that you're his son? He won't. He can't. He might come at you. The hand of the Lord is heavy upon me. He might come and put his hand on you. And... Make you feel a little bit under pressure. That's okay. That's God's love. Trying to steer you back to righteousness. Anyway, getting way off. We were going to talk about mustard seed faith, weren't we? <laughs> we got off. Oh, James chapter 1, verse 6. Let me see if I can wrap this up. James chapter 1. Here. James chapter 1, verse 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded and unstable in all his ways. So James is teaching us right here that we have to ask and we cannot doubt. So important. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. I think we already read that one. I'm not sure. <laughs> Yes, we already read that one. Yep, does not doubt in his heart. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew, Mark chapter 9, we already read all those. Okay, there was one I was going to read. What was it? So he says, faith like a mustard seed, right? So I have one final definition. 
So when after he cursed the fig tree, right? Uh, so it was Mark chapter 11, right? Watch this. We know Mark chapter 11 teaches us. <clears throat> I want to show you this parallel, okay? And it'll help answer what is mustard seed faith, okay? If, watch this. I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him, right? The parallel passage to this is Matthew chapter 21, verse 19, which we read already. It's our opening. Actually, it wasn't. Our opening one was... Uh, 21, 21. That's the same thing. If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. So which, one's the set, which one is the one that said, uh, if you have faith like a mustard seed? Matthew 17? All right, notice this. Jesus says in one story, if you have faith and do not doubt, you can say to this mountain, right? 21, 21. You can even say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. So, what does he describe? Faith and no doubt. Say to the mountain. Right? But if we go to Matthew chapter 17, he says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. Alright. So, here's the answer. What is... Mustard seed faith. Mustard seed faith equals faith without doubt. If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed and you may speak to this mountain. Okay. Matthew 17. And Matthew 21 says, if you have faith and do not doubt, you can say to this mountain, then that means the best way to understand what is a mustard seed faith, mustard seed faith is faith that does not doubt. So important to get this. From now on, when somebody says mustard seed faith, you'll know what that means. It has nothing to do with the size. It might have a little to do with the size. But this main point is not that. You can compare mountain... What, what is mustard seed faith? It's also mountain moving. Okay? Mountain moving. How do we know we have a mustard seed, mustard seed faith? It moves mountains. Whatever we prayed for, it happened. How do we know we had faith? Something happened. So, here's what we learn right here. Based off the scriptures, not based off man's doctrines, not based off your churches, not based off your denominations, not based... What does Jesus teach, okay? How do you know that you have faith? The mountain moves we have faith if the mountain moves that's how you know that's the only way to know that's the only way to test it how do you test it pray for something if it doesn't happen then now what does this mean does this mean that you never have does this mean that it's a you know a blanket statement like well, if I prayed and nothing happened, well, I must not have a mustard. No, it means that you didn't have a mustard seed faith at that moment. How do I know that? Because in Matthew chapter 10, they were casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out the, the demons and cleansing the lepers, right? Which means that when they spoke to the mountain, it moved. Which means they had faith and they did not doubt. But in Matthew 17, seven chapters later, the same dudes that were casting out demons before couldn't cast this demon out. It wasn't that that demon was bigger. It was that their faith was littler. 
The same faith would move both demons. That demon wasn't even as big as the mountain. The mountain's bigger than a demon. <laughs> That's why Jesus said it. He wanted to say, look, you couldn't move this demon, but I'm telling you, if you had faith and did not doubt, you would say to a mountain, move from here to there, it would obey you, and nothing, 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 absolutely nothing would be impossible for you. How do you know that you had doubt? Because something was impossible. How do you know you didn't have doubt? Because it wasn't impossible. It didn't say, if you had faith and do not doubt, nothing would be impossible for God. No. Nothing would be impossible for you. Because you're a son of God. Look, people say that all the time. Well, Jesus was the son of God. And you're not? Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. And you're not? Come on. Jesus was the true man. He was what we're supposed to look like. Do not build your doctrine and stuff off of what other men's experiences are. You should probably just build your doctrine off what Jesus' experiences were. Okay? And off of what Jesus taught. Amen? All right. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your news feed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boldest Align Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day